So much of my summer travel and talk commitments and projects are either finished or drawing to a close. And I haven't done any of these 10 shorts Q&As for a while, so I thought it would be a good idea for me to catch up a little bit on some of the questions that have been posted and uh, provide some, some answers for them. Here are 10 more. Um, they're all having to do with philosophy in one way or another. And they finish up with one that's kind of uh, funny at the end. So this is a particularly timely but also timeless question asked by Jeremy O'Kelly. And he's referring to people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who recently got himself in a little bit of hot water, and scientists like, like Dawkins and Hawking, who will say things like philosophy is dead or philosophy is irrelevant. Um, and he's asking, where do you think this is coming from, and how would I answer their, their claims that science has all of the, or will have, all of the answers to life's big questions? So I would point out that this is an issue as old as philosophy itself. Um, you see this coming up in Socrates' discussion in the Apology of the Tradespeople. Um, they know quite a bit about what it is that they, they know about, but then they, they go wrong in extrapolating that to the rest of reality. And science is particularly prone to that because in the modern age, science in the narrow sense that we, we now use it in, uh, becomes very powerful. It leads to technology and it, it you know has great advances, um, but it's also unable to be adequately self-reflective about, about its own processes. So it needs philosophy in large respects without realizing that it needs philosophy in order to fully understand what, it, what it's up to. And since the time of, you know, sort of the Hegelian project, that's, that's I think, been lost to, to sight. What's really interesting about these, these new claims that get made is that they're really just replications of older claims. As science advances, as we you know move from one, one theoretical framework to the next, um, they do the same thing that people were doing in the past. So none of these people are making claims radically different than 19th century uh, people who are totally enamored of, of science. They're just being couched in different terms. Taylor Adams asks uh, another question, which is not easy to answer in, in two minutes, and is going to depend kind of on the way in which we're understanding these terms and the frames of references that we're using. So here's the question. What is the difference between philosophy and science? So let's make it a little bit easier and put aside the social sciences um, social scientists are constantly engaged in, in the process of, of trying to figure out just exactly what they're up to anyway. Let's just talk about the natural sciences, the sciences that really are in, in large respect through technology, uh, you know, responsible for our modern world as, as we, we now know it. Um, so one thing I have to say at the very start is that every discipline insofar as it becomes adequately self-reflective and is carried out by people who are asking questions like, well, what, what exactly are we doing here? What are these entities that we're, we're working on? What, what, what's going on with them? It actually tends, you might say, asymptotically towards being philosophy. And, and in fact, many great scientists have also been philosophers. Um, I would say that those who are trained these days in the fields that we call the natural sciences quite often are not very self-aware of, you know, their epistemological assumptions, or at least some of them, um, some of their metaphysical assumptions, many of their moral assumptions. And, you know, what's the difference? Well, philosophy, in theory, extends to all of reality. Science, in theory, extends to the observable phenomenal world and what we really what we can measure what we can replicate if we want to be very strict about it so philosophy has a wider scope but is also a lot messier in in some respects than science now a lot of that's going to depend on your particular conception of philosophy and there are many different conceptions out there 
And there's, you know, several different conceptions of science out there as well, it should be pointed out. So my, my oft interlocutor, Zero She Flies, has a question about the term postmodernism in philosophy. Is it a useful, coherent umbrella term, or is it used more as a label to try and group disparate views and authors that are hard to pigeonhole, or a bit of both? I, I would say a bit of both. Um, the term itself, you know, leotard, if we want to be like purists about it, we'd go to leotard as the postmodern condition. Um, but very quickly, people started, you know, lumping all sorts of other authors into the postmodern. So a lot of the people in, in uh, continental philosophy, you know, ranging from Derrida to Deleuze, along with his, you know, Guattari, uh, Shadow, and Foucault, who are all doing, you know, quite different things, but are drawing on some, some similar authors as inspiration are considered to be postmodern. And then you get, you know, Friedrich Jameson coming along, writing a whole book about the postmodern um, and distinguishing between different ideas of it. So by the time that, you know, we get to where we are, I would say even just a couple decades ago, the term had branched out so much that it had lost a good bit of its meaning. I think that the, the idea that we, we use it to pigeonhole or, you know, to group uh, disparate groups, uh, disparate views and authors together is, is a, a very good idea. Um, a good idea in the sense that that's what's going on, not a good idea in the sense that we ought to be doing that. I think that a lot of people throw the word postmodern around and they have in mind, you know, this particular author or, you know, the thumbnail sketch of what that author is saying. And very often it's done in a pejorative context. Uh, where if you label somebody as postmodern, then you know they must be wrong, or they must be crazy, or they must be dangerous, or we should we should avoid them. Um, I don't use the term much myself. I, I actually prefer the term late modern, late modernity, but that's that's me. Mark Smith asks, is there much incorporation into philosophy as a discipline within the West of Eastern thoughts? And the, the simple answer to that is no, not a lot. Um, and I would say what there is of it tends to be pretty generic, pretty poorly informed by, you know, serious study of the, the Eastern texts and, and traditions and thinkers. Um, but I do think that it is getting better, uh, in part because there's a recognition that we ought to engage in some comparative philosophy. There was this period for a while where it was quite popular to talk about the axial age. Um, you know, historical study has shown us that that was largely, you know, sort of uh, reading stuff into history and kind of, kind of you know, wishful thinking, uh, because all these great sages were not arising at the same time in the same cultures and same contexts of the same problems. Uh, and many other really interesting things were happening outside of that, that time framework. But there's been a movement, and I think it's been spurred in part by multiculturalism, and this notion that you know we should at least give other other cultures the the benefit of the doubt and check them out, and I think all also partly spurred by the the I'll call it the second rise of the East, um, meaning that that India China they are you know not only powers on the economic scene but on the cultural scene as they used to be as it was through most of history. Uh, we're seeing the, the West no longer having the dominant position that, that it used to hold, or at least as dominant. And I think that it's a good thing because it leads us then to take seriously um, what's going on, not only in the traditions of, say, Indian and Chinese philosophy, and I know there's more than that, um, but also in contemporary stuff as well, to look at the contemporary developments, not only in, in, in philosophy, but also in the larger culture. For example, India recently uh, made part of its civil service examination. Uh, they have a component for ethics, which, you know, that's, that's kind of an interesting development there. So Devo Oved asks me the question, do I have any favorite Eastern philosophers? If so, could I discuss them a little? 
And the simple answer is no, I, I don't actually, in part because uh, I have not studied Eastern philosophy in any really serious way for probably at least a decade. Um, I had a very strong interest in that as an undergraduate and some interest in it, particularly because of philosophy of language uh, and, and looking at, at Chinese philosophy when I was a, a graduate student. And when I was teaching uh, for Ball State, I was teaching philosophy and religious studies, and the Eastern philosophy got taught under, under religious studies, uh, so I was doing some research into, into that then, mostly things having to do with Indian and, and Chinese philosophy. Um, but I haven't really devoted much much attention to that for a long time, and so anything that I could really say about that would be, you know, very generic. Um, I'm not a specialist by any any means. I'm not even a, a particularly good comparativist at this point in time. Maybe I will be down the line if I if I uh, find the time to you know dig back into those texts again. But uh, that's that's not where I am currently. Here's a question from SKWBTM1. Not sure how that should be pronounced. Dr. Sather, why is it that Haman, Lessing, and the Schlegels are excluded from philosophical discussions and perhaps Goethe too? Um, that's a good question. And is it because what they were doing was inherently less philosophical and more perhaps literary? or, you know, religious or something like that. I don't think that the answer to that is, is yes. I think that what often happens in philosophy is that there, there are, you know, there are currents, and people call philosophy whatever happens to be in the main current, and they kind of ignore the, the other stuff. Um, if this were 140 years ago, very few people would have heard of Kierkegaard, and, and we now know that he's you know major thinker, not only in terms of existentialism but dialectical philosophy as well. You know, um, people do studies on on Kierkegaard and and his connection to Hegel, to Schelling, to Kant. You know, all these sorts of things. Um, why are these guys passed up? Well, they don't, they don't fit neatly into the narratives of the history of philosophy that we want to, that we want to study. Um, they are, you know, people do work on them, but they're, they're, there's not a lot of people doing work on them in philosophy. It tends to be very specialized stuff. Um, I would say that in philosophy itself, the fact that analytic philosophy, which is in, in, inherently anti-historical and tends to estrange people from any sort of, you know, traditions of studying the text and placing the thinkers in context. And I would also say continental philosophy, too, in its own ways, because it established these canons of, you know, here's the critiques and stuff like that. Um, I would say that the dominance of those two modes also tended to push a lot of figures to the uh, to the margins, you could also say this about people in, in other traditions like de Tocqueville. You know why de Tocqueville is a philosopher? Why aren't we studying him in philosophy departments? Why only in political science departments? Good questions. Christopher Dunn asks a question about Saint Anselm, and it's does Anselm have a hierarchical or flat conception of free will? Uh, and I would say both and neither, uh, because I don't think that these categories are particularly useful when approaching the will to begin with and any sort of robust conception of the will. If you want to know what Anselm thinks about the will, then you have to spend the time going through Anselm's texts and, and reading them very closely and thinking about them. Anselm says that we understand will to mean three different but connected things. There's the instrument, the will is instrument. There is will as particular uses or occasions or willings. There is the will as affectio or, you know, in, we translate that as inclination, affection, uh, a number of different things. And all of them are the will. It's not as if the instrument is, you know, somehow more the will than the, these other things. And so, you you know, if you want to set up a hierarchy, you know, with second-order desires or stuff like that, you know, a la Frankfurt, you can do that, but now you're doing Frankfurt, not, not Anselm. Um, 
the thing to do is to actually look at the sort of things that Anselm writes about in the the, tr the treatises where he's talking about the will. So that would be, you know, everything from the De Veritate all the way to the the De Concordia, and in also including some of the stuff that hasn't been translated, like the, the De Similitudinibus and the Dicta on Salmi. Um, he has a very interesting conception of of the will. Which is, you know, I mean, you can use these these notions to sort of illuminate them, but I think it's better just to like go straight to his conceptions, and and stick with them. The will is complex because it is able to self determine, but does that mean that it's like you know radically free at every moment? No, because the will can also, you know, uh, enslave itself to to things, and that takes place through the the, the modality of will that he calls affectio. So Terence uh, Rochen or Roken uh, says, "How do you or can you say a person is obligated to do something without them agreeing to said obligation?" And he gives an example here of um, you know a person ought to save someone drowning in three inches of water if it takes no effort, but if they never agreed to, we can't establish an ob obligation for them to do so. So, I mean, for me, this is I don't believe that obligations. Uh, depend entirely on our having agreed to. So there's a basic level disagreement there, and I don't think most moral theorists uh, believe that we're only obligated to do what we've we've agreed to. And I'd like to point out, you know, a, a, a sort of conceptual problem with that. Um, what would motivate you to agree to anything if you didn't already have some vague, non, you know, dependent on that sense of obligation already operative? You know, I mean, you can try to, to do social contract theory or some sort of Hobbesian egoism or something like that. That doesn't get you very far, and those sorts of moral theories end up, you know, capturing a little bit of what we call ethics or morality or, or ethical life or moral decision making. But they end up so they end up leaving so much out, distorting so much that I I don't find them particularly useful, except as you know examples of how we shouldn't think about things, how how lower level things, lower level theories think about it, inadequate theories. So. Uh, how can you, how how do you or can you say a person is obligated to do something without them agreeing to that obligation? We do it all the time. Um, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, I don't want to say silly question, but it, it's it's an off-base question. We have some obligations, and, and then we can ask, where's the source of those? But they sure don't depend entirely on our having agreed to them beforehand. So Taylor Adams asks me another question. What does someone who has a PhD think about counterfactual logic? And I assume that he's meaning this this PhD here, i.e. me. Um, you know, I don't have any problem with, with people um, using counterfactuals in all sorts of reasoning processes. So if that's what you mean by counterfactual logic, that's fine. Maybe what you mean by that is what we call modal logic, where we're dealing with possibility and necessity. There's also some, some projects out there to try to derive something like a logic of moral obligations, you know. Um, there's various names for that, that sort of thing. But I, I don't have any, you know, my metaphysics does not, you know, rule out counterfactuals, you could say. So I'm, I'm not sure quite what the question is about, but I don't, I don't have any problem with counterfactual logic. So we end on kind of a, a funny question uh, by Jimmy Page. Would you consider yourself a genius? Just curious. So the simple answer is no. Um, and I'll go into that in, in, a, in a moment. Um, I think if I, if I were to consider myself a genius, that would probably be a big mistake on my part, but I'm really in no danger of that because I've, I've spent enough time um, doing things that have, have been difficult for me and uh, encountering obstacles and setbacks that, you know, and also making dumb, dumb mistakes, uh, that if I had any temptation to consider myself a genius at this point, um, 
I would have plenty of material to draw on to say, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, um, I do think that, uh, you know, there are geniuses, and I think that they're a bit more, uh, you know, there's that sort of definition of, you know, IQ tests and stuff like that. And even with that, I, I didn't make the cutoff. I think I had 139 when I had an IQ test when I was a kid, and I think 140 is the cutoff for that. But, you know, real genius is not so much about, about IQ. It's about, um, you know, creativity and making connections and brilliance and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm fortunate because many of the, the people who I get to, to spend time with and work on are the geniuses of history. So, you know, Plato and Aristotle, Anselm, Aquinas, uh, Maurice Blondel, Blondel, Hegel, um, even, you know, in a certain way, Jacques Lacan, who I, I, I like quite a bit. Um, they're all arguably geniuses. And I get to spend time, you know, trying to delve into and then, and then explain they're brilliant insights. Um, I'm not so concerned about expressing my own, even if I had any. 